Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to continue our story of nationalism and industrialization by moving to the Ottoman Empire and talking about the era of great reform or Tanzimat. So let's dive into our story and look at how the Ottoman Empire is going to be affected by all of these massive changes that are happening in Europe. Here's our objectives for today, and then we're going to dive in. As you hopefully remember, the Ottoman Empire was one of our great gunpowder empires, who is both, you know, partially a Middle Eastern Muslim country, but also have some, has some role in European politics, European trade, things like that. We remember in the 1500s, the Ottoman Empire was, of course, a massive source of political and economic stability and growth, and was one of the truly great powers of the pre, sort of pre-modern world. But we also remember that although the Ottoman Empire had a pretty substantial, a pretty effective bureaucracy set up through the whole Devshirme system, and they were able to get government officials and viziers who were pretty capable, the leadership of the Ottoman Empire had become somewhat questionable. And after Suleiman, they had dealt with a series of pretty incompetent sultans, leading to a slow and gradual decline of the empire sort of similar to what you see in the later stages of the Chinese dynasties and the Mughal Empire, although, of course, the Mughals also have the added pressure of the British, which we're going to spend some time talking about in, in future lessons. The Ottoman Empire at one point had significant European holdings under Suleiman getting all the way to the gates of Vienna. But, and we're going to see significant pushback by, the, uh, by European powers against the Ottoman Empire during this time period and a slow and gradual decline until uh, eventually it collapses after World War I. But the Ottomans are not just going to sit by and watch the world pass them by. There's going to be a series of reforming sultans who are going to attempt to make important changes to the empire in order to bring them into the modern world and have them take their place amongst the other growing European powers. So here's a basic European description of the Ottoman Empire laying out what they think are the problems. Keep in mind as you read this that this is an outsider looking in at the empire. So on the one hand, you've got some clear biases here. But on the other hand, he's pretty accurately describing the problems that the Ottoman Empire are facing. So pause, read, let's move on. This perception that the Ottoman Empire was on, the, on its last legs leads to the idea that it become, that it is now what's called the sick man of Europe. And that as other European powers start to grow, what they should start doing is taking away territory from the Ottoman Empire, both because the Ottoman Empire, in their opinion, can't effectively govern these territories, but also because they see clear motivations to, to do so in increasing their own power. This is tied into the whole era of European imperialism, but because it's happening sort of right on the doorstep of Europe, we're going to talk about it here. And because the Ottoman Empire is going to play a large role in European politics going all the way up to World War I, we're tying it into our era of European nationalism. The sultan who's going to push back against this sort of mod this uh, European tidal wave of modernization and encroachment is Mahmoud II. He's going to be a reforming sultan who's going to try to cut down on the power of the Janissary Corps. Mahmoud is also going to try to modernize the Ottoman Empire, bringing in modern schools, sort of the same way Peter the Great did in Russia. He's going to bring in modern styles of dress and clothing. But the big piece is he wants to bring in the sort of modern military developments that have come as part of the French Revolution. The French Revolution and, of course, the things that the Prussians have done and stuff like and uh, those type of military reforms have moved towards the sort of use of infantry and specifically sort of the very well ordered infantry and standing armies that European powers are now relying on. France demonstrated the power of a fully militarized state, and pretty much every other state in Europe saw that and realized if we want to be a real global power, we're going to need to emulate some of the things that the French have done. Mahmoud, uh, one of the other things that Mahmoud faced is uh, the Greek independence movement. So when the Greek people pushed back and tried to have their revolution, sort of at the same time that the revolutions of 1830, this is about the same time that the July monarchy is coming, that the Bourbons are being overthrown in France and the July monarchy is coming into being, what we're going to see is European intervention to help the Greeks. Europeans saw the Greek independence as part of reclaiming European heritage from the Ottoman Empire. And so we're going to see some significant naval support to the Greek rebels, which is really going to prevent the Ottoman Empire from mobilizing and is going to lead to the loss of their Greek territories, which is a huge loss to the Ottoman state. 
The Battle of Navarino has the, uh, the Ottoman Navy absolutely obliterated by a joint English, French, and Russian force. So despite the fact that the Ottoman Navy was much larger than any of the other forces, modern European weapons have shown that the Ottoman Empire has just fallen significantly behind in military technology. Because they haven't industrialized, their cannons can't fire accurately at the same distance. And so the British, French, and Russian ships are able to simply cut the Ottoman military apart demonstrating that although they were once sort of at the peak of military power and preparedness, they've now really fallen off and vast changes are going to need to happen if they're going to be able to modernize. The group that was standing the most in the way of modernization is the Janissaries, who had gone from being sort of an elite soldier class to being much more of an entrenched hereditary bureaucracy. And so passing on their janitary, janitary status to their sons, they were no longer eunuchs, and they had, re, they had re, uh, replaced and overthrown a number of sultans who had attempted to challenge them. So Mahmoud II set up what's called the auspicious incident in order to cut down the power of the Janissary Corps. He uh, passed military reforms, and then when the Janissaries tried to remove him, he set up a series of, uh, he set up a series of powerful guns and slaughtered them. An artillery, an artillery barrage crushed the first Janissary assault, and then he hunted them down throughout the empire and formally exterminated the Janissaries forever, getting rid of this elite warrior class and bringing in a modern military. So bringing in, bringing in modern military tactics, bringing in Europeans, specifically French people, to help train Ottomans, Ottoman commanders in modern military uh, techniques, and bringing in new types of technology in order to try to modernize the military. And so by crushing these sort of established entrenched forces, Mahmoud II catapulted the Ottoman Empire into sort of the ranks of powerful European militaries. He also started to commission a modern navy with uh, much more advanced ships using European techniques and going into pretty significant debt to do so because, of course, shipbuilding is very expensive. And so we're, we're going to need to, he's going to also need to modernize the economy and tax systems because the type of sort of pre-modern decentralized tax systems that had worked before are not going to provide the funding to create a large standing army and a large standing navy, which modern states need if they're going to compete with people like France, England, this new country, Germany, Russia, things like that. We're also going to see new types of dress come in. They're going to get much more European styles of dress. We're going to start seeing legal reforms, a new, uh, a new commercial code opening up the economy and cutting down the power of guilds. They're going to bring in new scientific techniques, new schools, new uh, forms of education imported from France. Basically, the government is going to bring in all of the great innovations of the French Revolution and bring it into the Ottoman Empire. In, the, in this era of Tanzimat to try to reform and modernize the Ottoman state and make them a power on par with all the other great states of Europe. Here's uh, some of the reforms that are being passed here. We're going to see equal protection under the law, a regular system of taxes. We're going to see conscription, forced military service, all these pieces from the French Revolution brought into the Ottoman Empire. And all of this are all of these things absolutely necessary for modernizing, again, the Ottoman state and making them effective. We're also going to see an adequate census in order to assess tax revenue. We're going to see, again, modern forms of dress moving away from sort of traditional Ottoman and Turkish styles and adopting much more European styles. And we're going to see them create a centralized bank similar to the Bank of England or the Bank of France in order to try to provide aid for all of this and provide the sort of financial backing. And so the Ottoman Empire, again, is going to import a bunch of foreign sort of systems and try to graft them onto their existing imperial structure with some measures of success. We're going to see some slow changes, but the Ottoman Empire is a very ancient, large, entrenched society. And so trying to completely have one ruler reform all these things is going to be incredibly challenging, and the changes are going to happen pretty incrementally. It's very difficult to completely overturn your society without having a massive French Revolution style thing. And obviously, the sultans of the Ottoman Empire don't really want to reform the political system. And so that's going to be somewhat problematic. The Crimean War is one of the main wars that sort of establishes the new status quo in Europe. Russia is going to be pushing into the Crimean Peninsula. 
and pushing into sort of Ottoman territories in, uh, in the Balkans. This is going to be one of the main sources of conflict that eventually leads up to World War I. And Russia, Russia has been pushing against the Ottoman Empire since the days of Catherine the Great. As you hopefully remember with our lessons about Russia, Russia desperately wanted to capture the second Rome, Constantinople, the great Orthodox city of the Byzantine Empire, because as a predominantly Orthodox state, they saw this as sort of the Rome of Russia. And so if they could recapture Constantinople, this great ancient metropolis, it would significantly increase their prestige and, of course, be culturally and religiously important. At the Battle of Sinope, the uh, Ottoman forces are going to face off against Russian forces, and it's going to go spectacularly poorly. It turns out that trying to create a modern navy is very, very complicated. And despite the fact that the Russians were not particularly good at, their, at building a modern navy either, the Ottomans made a series of vast miscalculations, which led to the absolute obliteration of their new modern navy. And so that's a bunch of money that's just thrown down the drain. And then the Ottomans are really going to, so uh, the destruction of the Ottoman navy, incredibly devastating and a huge setback for the empire. We're also going to see on the, and the ground forces, their modern military is really not up to dealing with Russia. Russia has their own logistical problems and their own issues. Europeans are learning the same lesson that the Americans are learning during this time. Modern weapons means that traditional military tactics, your whole Napoleon-style wave attacks, are just absolute suicide. Modern rifles are so much more accurate that trying to charge en enemy forces, especially entrenched enemy forces, is simply a good way to just get huge amounts of your troops killed. Both sides learn this during this time. The Russian military is slightly more modernized than the, Russia, than the Ottoman military at this point for reasons that we'll talk about next time when we talk about reform in Russia. And so the Ottomans absolutely struggle on, in the land battles of the Crimean War, so much to the extent that England and France actually intervene on the side of the Ottomans and go and fight back and just destroy the Russians. The Crimean War is incredibly unpleasant. We'll just let you allow you to read this and then move on. And so all of this leads to a spectacular humiliation for the Ottoman Empire, and they push into another round of Tanzimat. More reforms, more attempts to change things, more attempts to move forward and to, try to attempt to modernize. We're going to see another round of potential reforms here in which they're going to create, for example, a legislature in order to give the people more representation. They're going to try to create a written constitution in order to bring sort of constitutional government to the Ottoman Empire and modernize it even more. And there's going to be more attempts to graft European political and economic systems onto the existing Ottoman Empire. Take a moment and uh, read this and we'll take it in. One of the big goals of this, as stated in this document, is to continue to get England and France to support the Ottoman Empire by making the Ottoman Empire appear as European as possible. The Ottomans understood that in the Crimean War, it was revealed that they could not effectively stand against the Russians. And so if they can continue to appeal to England and France to help them against the growing Russian presence, they could that, that would be basically their only path to survival. And so this second round of Tanzimat is to make the Ottoman Empire look as European as possible so Europeans won't let other Europeans take them over. It's a messy, messy proposition, but it's effective. And in the Russo-Turkish War, the Russians do significantly crush the Ottoman Empire and get very close to Constantinople. But again, England and France intervene, and the Ottoman Empire does lose Balkan territories and create a series of new somewhat unstable states that are going to be problematic here for a while. But at the Congress of Berlin, they give back some significant territories here. The Russian Empire does not get Constantinople, and it's going to be continue, and they're going to continue to use the Ottoman Empire, the powers of England, France, and Germany are going to keep using the Ottoman Empire as a shield against the Russians, and they're going to really prevent the Russians from trying to uh, ob obtain their eastern objectives, basically taking over Constantinople and partitioning up the Ottoman Empire. And so the Ottoman Empire is going to survive partially because of reforms that they had within the empire, but even more so because of outside European intervention. And so we're going to have the Ottoman Empire hanging on for just a while longer. Hopefully you can answer these objectives in some detail, 
For tomorrow, we're going to look at the modernization of Russia, and we're going to look at the Crimean War from a Russian perspective, because honestly, the Crimean War is one of those wars that really no one is happy with. But for now, we're going to leave the Ottoman Empire behind and, uh, and wrap up today's lesson. So thank you for listening.